what's going on. I found sometimes the fish don't care. So this is a uh, Prince nymph. Uh, and what you have with the Prince nymph is you have, a, and, and it's, a, it's a mayfly. Okay, so if I could ask people to mute their microphones then please, because they're, the screen's bouncing around, so we can default so, to. Um, so the, the Prince nymph has two biots off the tail for, uh, to, to represent the, the tail of the nymph. And then there's these lace, white, little white ones that end up on the top. And I don't know what the hell they're supposed to represent as, a, as part of the nymph. Uh, maybe just an attractor. The body is peacock curl, and it's got a, a gold rib on it. And this version has a uh, gold bead. And you'll be able to see under here, there's a little bit of red. This is one of these things that uh, we discovered fishing for uh, whitefish in the Red Deer River that uh, a little red tag seems to make the fly a little more effective. And then and the legs are just a bit of uh, a grizzly, ha or, sorry, brown hackle, uh, saddle hackle. So that's the basic nature of the fly. It's, a, it's one of the more effective nymphs that you can fish, particularly in rivers. So I'm gonna take that out. So here's it's also a very the, good pattern for lakes, um, yep. I find, for, um, for water boatmen. Yeah. Um, we, don't, we don't get a lot of sizes and you fish it like a boatman on a, on a floating line. I've, I used to tie a bunch of like different boatman things and then I got lazy and I just started to fish uh, a prince nymph. If I see fish, they're feeding close to the surface on boatmen. This yeah. is my go-to fly now, so it's so so out on the island. There's not in South Island. There's not a lot of places that have boatmen. So, yeah, but uh, you guys go to the interior all the time, don't interior you? BC. There'll be boatmen <clears throat> in the fall. Um, so there's a bead. It's a fairly small gold bead that I put on. And again, if you ever are going to tie lots of bead flies, these uh, specialty tw uh, tweezers that have a little hole on them make it a lot easier to handle beads. So the thread is, is a black a dot. The tag, I've got some, to make that little tag at the end, I've got some uh, red, very fine floss that I'm gonna use. Um, the the uh, biots I'm using for this one are, are goose biots. They generally, when you can buy them in this string like this, and and what this comes from, this comes from the leading edge of a primary flight feather on a goose. Um, these are dyed brown, and I've got some white ones here as well. And the biots are these little little feathers here. And then for the legs, it's just a saddle hackle, and I, it's a fairly fine saddle hangle, hackle with short barbs. Um, peacock curl for the body. And uh, the rib to reinforce the peacock curl is fine copper wire. So we'll start by tying in behind the bead. And uh, I usually wrap up about halfway back to start with. And bring it back just to get the thread attached. And then I'm gonna take my, uh, my floss, my red floss, and I'm gonna attach it to the hook. And here's a little trick. I make I make a one wrap, and then I pull it back, and then I don't have to trim. So we we'll do that with you can do that with a lot of materials, peacock curl and so on. And then I'm going to take my thread right back to the front again. I'm going to take the floss, and I'm going to wrap it to the back.
And then I'm gonna wrap it in touching wraps around the bend of the hook. And all we're doing here is I'm making a little red tag that uses the floss, the red floss, and it's very fine floss. And I'm just gonna make one that's about an eighth of an inch long. And I can bring my black thread to the back to where that is. And I'm gonna tie it off. Now, right at this point, now this is, this is what Dennis wanted to know, is how do I manage these biots when they're on the hook like that? Um, so all I'm gonna do is right where the tag ends, I'm going to make a little bump with three or four wraps of thread over top of each other, right at the back. Then I'm gonna position my thread right in front of the bump. And the next thing is, I'm gonna get my uh, wire here, if I can find it, find the end. Come out there. Where's the end? The end has disappeared on me here. <laughs> there it is. One of the problems with this fine wire is if you don't uh, don't hold it captive on the spool, it'll go sprawling on you, and then you'll be faced with dealing with it forever. Spool keeper, Dave. Yeah, well, I'm too lazy to make them. So I bring my thread right back up to the bead. I shove the wire into the back of the bead, the end of it. And then I'm gonna wrap the wire and I'm gonna try and position the wire on the far side of the hook. So that it's right on the far side. When I get back to the bump that I made, I'm gonna stop and then hold the wire out of the way for the time being. Now with the thread right smack in front of the bump, I'm gonna get myself a biot off of this, uh, section here and you see it's slightly curved so i'm going to put it on the on the hook curve down the tip backwards and i'm going to measure it so that the the part that protrudes behind the hook is about the gap width of the hook and the trick here to make this work and this is what dennis was interested in is I hold the, the biot on top of the hook at a 45 degree angle. And then I hold it down with the index finger of my left hand. And I make a wrap over the biot, two wraps, not real hard. And then I, once I get it there, I grab it and I position it so that it's at that 45 degree angle sticking out the back. And then I repeat with the other biot. Again, this time I measure it against the other, the biot that's already on the hook and put it on there so that their ends are even at that 45 degree angle. And then I'm gonna hold it down with my index finger and then a couple of wraps couple of wraps to hold it in place and then I can kind of manipulate it a little bit so that they're sitting on top of the hook at that 45 degree angle and then I'm going to wrap forward with the right wind binding down the bias till I get just behind where the bead is 
And the whole purpose of this is not to make a, a lump at the back of the body. And then I'm gonna trim those guys off. Time down. So far so good. Then thread back to the back of the hook. Just make sure they're in the right place. Right to where the bats are. Then I get my peacock curl. And usually I use for a fly this size, which is quite small, I'm going to use only two strands of peacock curl. Just two. And I'm going to tie them in tip first, but the real front end of the tip is a little fragile. So I'm going to trim them off fairly short. I'm going to lay them on the hook and tie them in. Now, a lot of people would reinforce these. I'm going to wrap it back to where the bias are tied in would reinforce these with thread before they wrap them forward. But because I'm going to overwrap with the copper wire, I don't need to reinforce them with thread. So now I'm going to ring, bring this forward, thread forward just behind the bead. And then I'm going to start wrapping my peacock curl. And because I started with the tip of the peacock curl, you'll see that as I go forward, the body is going to start skinny and it's going to start getting a little bit bigger as I get towards the front of the hook. And then when I get probably uh, just a little gap between the peacock curl and the, and the bead, that's where I'm going to stop. And I'm going to tie it down with a couple of wraps in behind and then a couple of wraps in the front. And I'm going to trim it off. One more wrap for measure. Then I'm going to take my wire and I'm going to wrap it the opposite direction over the peacock curl. And I'm going to make probably four wraps of wire up through the body of the peacock curl. When I get behind the bead, I'm going to wrap it right there. Couple over top, couple in front. I'm going to get in here and trim that wire off. Bury the end. So that's the body with the tail. And the next thing is I'm going to make the hack make the legs. Now you can you can do the legs by taking a, a, a bunch of strands of, of hackle, turning the fly upside down and tying them in underneath. But I find that really awkward to do in this small size. So what I'm going to do with this guy is I'm going to stroke the hackle backwards so that I can, and I'm only going to need enough hackle to make two, maybe three wraps. And to keep that legs from being too uh, full, I'm gonna strip the barbs off of one side of the hackle. So it's just half a hackle. Just being ordinary. So there we go, we have half a hackle. I'm going to do that for uh, about the length of the fly. Then I'm going to take the hackle tip, put it right behind the bead, and tie it down. And again, tie it a couple wraps behind, a couple wraps in front, and that locks that in there so it's not going to come out. Trim the tip, and then I can start wrapping the hackle around the fly. And I'm gonna just, I say, 
two, maybe three wraps. And again, wrap over the hackle in the back. And then a couple in front, right behind the bead. And then I trim it. Now, the last thing I do is I'm going to take my fingers, wet them a little bit, and I'm going to push those hackle barbs down beside the hook so they're all pointing down. Then I'm going to make three or four wraps just to hold them in place like that. So they're pointing the hackle fibers down and towards the rear of the hook. That makes the legs of the fly. And now the uh, parts that uh, add a little zing to this thing is the white biots. So I'm going to take one, and it's the same drill. Again, curved side facing down. And I'm going to measure it so that the, the, the biot is just to the bend of the hook. And then I'm going to hold it down with my index finger again. A wrap over top, a couple of three wraps. Whoops, that wrapped all the way around, so we'll undo that. Try again. That's the, the trick is to get it at that 45 degree angle and sitting right on top of the hook. That one's not working right. I, I think that's too soft a biot. Let's get another one. Sometimes they're, they're, the, the biots are too soft and they're too compliant. They, uh, they fold away too easy. There we go. That's a little better. Okay. Once again, that is a little long, so I'm just going to tug it forward just a hair. And I'm going to do the same thing with the other one. Place it on the hook right on top. And I can measure it up against the one that's already there. So it's the same length. And gentle wrap, and then a little tougher. So now we've got same sort of thing. They're kind of a 45 degree angle. And then I'm going to just do a wrap in front just to make sure they're locked in. My thread's in the way here. And then trim off the, the excess. Come out of there. Come on. The other one. Go. And then I'm just going to wrap those little butt ends down a bit and do my whip finish. And there you are a uh, beat head Prince Nymph. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Very effective. I, I really like that uh, red tag in the back, but when I was tying on the, trying to tie on the biots in the front, yep. the, actual, the method I saw and tried to copy was you cut them at an exact angle and size so it fits right up against the bead at the right angle. Yeah, and, then that, that's, and that's where I was having difficulty. I guess maneuvering yeah, my fingers. Yeah, because then, then you're not going to necessarily get them at the right angle because they're hard to manipulate. Yeah, and, yeah. And and then and then uh, trying to match them in terms of length is difficult. So that's yeah. why I lay them across, measure them up, and then hold them in place right on Watch. top of the hook. Do a couple of wraps, and there you go. Okay. Thank you. So there you are. I have to say that's fairly complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I also found that doing uh, a little red bot very effective. I used to use it in salmon flies, and I also used to make a combination green bot, red bot, with just one strand each. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems that there's all those little, those little tricks. Of a black gnat that I used to tie, and I used that yes. in Labrador. Yeah, the original black gnat that was basically just uh, a, a, a fluffy peacock curl body. Those were tied with a little red tag on them, right? Yeah. And uh, those are effect. That's an effective fly. I, I uh, fished until I had no flies left. <laughs> those, uh... That's the way to go. All right, so. Any other questions? You made it look too easy. I agree. <laughs> well, after you've tied a few, you get better, you know. And that, that's, a, that's a trick of, of fly tying is uh, what you really should do is uh, sit down and say, okay, I'm going to tie at least a half a dozen flies. And by the time you get to the fifth or sixth, you're doing them right. <laughs> or you're frustrated. The and the ones that are crappy, just take the razor blade and cut them off. <laughs> Save the hook. <laughs> so that's that guy. Now, the next one, if I can get the guy out here. This is a, a, a different use for a biot. This, this time, the biot is going to be the body of the mayfly. And if we tie it on right, the biot will make its own rib. So we don't need to, to tie a rib on. Uh, this is an emerger style mayfly, which means it's going to be fished in the surface film. Uh, and that's why we're using a parachute hackle. Now, for those who don't know, a parachute is where you tie a, an upright wing and you make what's called a wing post and then you wrap your hackle around the post rather than around the hook. And what that means is that when it sits in the water, the weight of the hook keeps it, because it's a dry fly hook, it, it keeps it light, but it keeps it so that the, the point of the hook is in the surface film, as is the body. And these hackle fibers sit right on top of the surface film. Um, and this little bit at the back is what's called a trailing shuck which is if the mayfly is hatching, it always leaves its uh, case, a nymphal case behind. So the materials for this are... Um, this is the RS quad, isn't it? It's very similar, yeah, uh, to the RS quad, except uh, the wing material is not, uh, is not turkey flats. I've always found this fly to be excellent when the fish, the mayfly is on and it's been on for a few days and the trout are sucking them in versus taking them. Yeah. So the wing material in this is, uh, is antron. And you just, it's like wool. So that's, that's the wing material. The, uh, the trailing shock, is a, a product that used to be called Zelon, but it's, it's basically, it's an antron. It's carpet fiber. It's what they call trilobal carpet fiber. The, the fibers have uh, three sides to them and they kind of glisten. And I use a little rusty brown one <clears throat> for the trailing shock. Okay, so here, then, here's <clears throat> all the, uh, this is one of the views and you can see that you're, you're here and you're muted. And then the biots are goose, are turkey biots. They're not goose. So it's a primary flight feather, even though they don't fly well, of a tur turkey. And we're going to take the leading edge ones off the turkey. You'll see in the middle of the, of the feather, how long these biots are. And if you're making a larger mayfly, 
these biots are in the middle are great uh, because we're wrapping them around the hook. The downside is the middle ones are wider, so you don't get as many wraps unless you're, you've got a long hook shank. So we're probably going to use the ones that are up here at the outer tip that are, that are a little shorter in, in terms of, of uh, length, and they're also a little narrower, so you'll get more ribs. And I'll show you what the key is for that. Um, thorax is uh, Antron, Antron dubbing. It's a, it's a fine Antron. It dubs really nice. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of it. The hook, where did I find the hook? I'm using the, uh, this Hanek uh, dry fly barbless. It's a standard hackle length or standard hook length. Um, and again, this is a fairly lightweight hook because you want it to float, the whole fly hey. to float. Yeah. Silly question. You've mentioned in previous sessions a wet fly hook and a dry fly hook. What's the mm. difference? The difference is in the gauge of the wire. The wet fly hooks are a much heavier gauge wire. And they're a little bit different to sign. Yeah. Yeah. The wet fly, the wet fly hooks have a heavier wire um, and they, they tend to sink easier. That's partly why. And the dry fly hooks are a much finer wire. Thread is uh, eight dot olive for this one. You can use whatever color the mayfly you're tying is. So I start on the hook and I wrap halfway down the shank before I trim the excess, trim the tag off. Now if I was Phil Riley, I'd just snap it off, but I can't do that. <laughs> and then from the halfway point, I bring my thread up to the one third point on the shank. So two thirds from the bend to the eye and, and a third back from the eye. This is where I'm going to tie in the wing. And I don't care if there's a little bit of, of hook shank in front of the wing position because the hackle extends out over that. And taking this antron, and I'm not going to take the full whack. I'm going to take just enough to make a decent wing and usually gap width, the gap of the hook. And I'm going to take a piece that's uh, an inch or so long, about like that. And then I'm going to measure it the full length of the hook. Take it with my thumb and forefinger and I'm going to set that down over the thread and I'm going to make a couple of wraps to cinch that wing down right on top of the hook. When I finish that I'm going to lift it up and do two or three wraps in front. That's, that's our wing. I'm going to push it down for a sec. And then I'm going to take the tag end of this and hold it up at a bit of an angle and I'm going to place my scissors parallel to the hook shank and trim off the excess. Now what that does is that creates a little tapered area here that I'm going to bind down onto the hook shank. And now you can see that the where I've tied down the butts ends of those that it's it's tapered from the tie-in point to the back and that means that we're going to have a nice even skinny body behind the uh, wing. I'm gonna bring the thread in front again, a couple of wraps, and then I'm gonna do what's called posting the wing, which means I take the thread around the wing, over top of the hook, and I'm not gonna do it a lot, but this is just to start the wing post. So I got like about four wraps there, and then I'm done that. I'm going to bring my thread to about halfway back, just a little bit behind where I finished tying in the uh, tying in the wing, and I'm going to take some of this antron, this this Zilon or antron, and I don't need much. 
So I'm going to take just a few strands of it. That might be a little bit too much. And again, I'm going to measure that. I'm going to make it the full shank length of the hook out behind the hook. So I'm going to wrap this down there, right behind the where I tied off the wing. And I'm going to trim the excess off. And you see now I've got a, a nice little taper between where I've tied the wing material down all the way back. And this, again, I'm going to take it to the bend of the hook and then just slightly past because I want this trailing shuck to point downwards a little bit at the back end. And I'm going to stop there. And now comes the biot. So I'm going to take a biot off of the side of this uh, feather. And the trick is don't cut it off. You have to pull it off. And there's a reason for that. If you look carefully at where the, how the biot comes off when you pull it, there's a little really hard to see in this one. There's a little notch right here where the curly tag bit is. Let's see if I can get that. There's a little notch. And that little notch is, is the indicator as to how you tie this on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie it on tip first with the notch facing up and forward. And I'm going to tie it on so that there's a little bit of the tip sticking forward. And I'm going to just bind that right down on the body all the way up to where the wing is. And I'm going to leave my head right at the back, thread right at the back of the wing. And then for what this, size thread are you, what size thread are you using, Dave? Eight aught. Eight aught. It's very fine. The whole idea is you don't want to make a big bulky body. This is a dry fly. Now you see that. I don't know if how hard it is to see. There's this little notch here, and that notch is facing forward. So I'm going to grab this hackle pliers onto the end of the biot. And I'm going to start wrapping it with that notch to the front. And the reason for doing it that way is that, that as I wrap this that way, because the, with the notch is to the front, there's this little ridge. Ah, it's one of the problems. These things are kind of fragile, so you can't pull too hard. There's this little ridge that forms as you wrap the biot forward. Be ornery. Come on, get on the end. Of it. Get on the end there. There we go. And we're making these wraps. You can see where the ridge overlaps the previous wrap. So I don't know if you can see it in this, but every one of these little wraps leaves a little ridge on the body. And I keep going. So I've got, again, I'm not sure how well you can see it with, I don't have a webcam, so it doesn't give you a close enough thing. Keeps letting go. Hackle pliers are a little cheap. Oh, rats, you let go again. I find when you have older material it gets dried out, causes that to happen. That, that's part of it. It's, it's just that my, it's not breaking, it's that the hackle pliers are letting go. Uh, I, I think I need to do is take a little sandpaper to the jaws of the hackle pliers and, and that should do it. There we go. Get one more wrap, maybe two. 
There we go. You also get a little bit more control if you use rotary hackle pliers because you have a longer. Yeah, the rotary ones. My rotary ones. Handles. My rotary ones are even worse than these ones. I could, probably could have used a little longer by it too. Anyway, okay. That didn't quite get wrapped as far forward as I wanted, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Now I've got some light ball of uh, Antron W. And before I put that on, I'm gonna tie in my hackle. Yep. So this is a fairly fine grizzly hackle. I'm, I'm just curious, it. how do you assemble all these fly hooks without all the equipment you have? <laughs> like, can you, you do this all by hand? Uh, no, you need you need most of the material, the equipment. You need the bits and pieces. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm stripping off the barbs on this hackle. So I have just stem exposed. And then I'm going to tie this on just on the near side, right behind the, the wing. And then I'm going to just wrap the stem down in front to make sure it's secure. And get in with my scissors and trim the, trim the excess off. And then I'm going to do what we call post the, the hackle, which means I'm going to go around the wing and the hackle stem up the wing. And I'm going to go like three or four wraps up the wing. I'm going to leave it there for the moment. So I've now wound the, the hackle stem up the post of the wing. And you'll see why in a minute. So now I need to build the thorax of this fly, which on the mayfly is where all of the little muscles are that allow them to flap their wings. Very fine material. I'm going to wrap some behind and some underneath. That's enough. And then I'm going to take my thread over behind the wing and just let it hang on the far side. Then take my grizzly hackle and I'm going to Give it a little tug straight down. And what that does is that bends the stem so that the first wrap is going to be parallel to the hook shank. And I make a wrap around the post. The next wrap, I have to wrap underneath the previous wrap, which means I kind of pull down each time I get across the hook shank, pull down over the hook shank, down on the other side or hook shank down on the other side. So far, so good. Now, when I get to the last wrap after three or four, I'm going to again pull straight down on the hackle with my left hand here. And I'm gonna take the thread over the hook shank, over the eye, but under the hackle. And I'm gonna wrap it around that two or three times, maybe four. and then let it hang down. And you'll see now my excess hackle is pointing straight down, thread out of the way. And I'm gonna come in here underneath, slide my scissors right up underneath to the bottom of the hook and trim off the excess. And now the, ne the next trick, trick is, I no longer go around the hook to finish this fly off. I take it out of the vise and turn it vertically like that. 
And now I'm going to whip finish around the post. So I'm going to take my fingers and underneath the hackle, I'm going to wrap around the post with my whip finish. Pull it in and that's it. Trim the, trim the, come on, trim the thread off here. Now by doing all of that, you'll see that there's nothing sticks down below the, uh, the body of the fly. All that hackle sits on top. So, and it, horizontal so that when you, when it lands on the water, it's going to uh, sit with those hackle fibers right on the surface film. And the wing, you can leave the wing fairly long. Actually, a reasonably long wing helps it land upright properly. And that's it. There you go. Uh, just a comment, uh, Dave. Uh, sure. I've got a pair of hackle pliers that has uh, rubber on one side of the jaws. Yeah. And that seems to grip reasonably well until the yeah, rubber gets have... old and deteriorates. Yeah, yeah, that's what I have is I have a pair of those there that they're the, uh, they're the ones that, that spin, like they're, uh, they're hackle pliers that, that twist. Right. Where are they here? Okay, I'll show you. Mohammed asked about your equipment, Dave. We'll have to have you one uh, session just show you all, uh, show us all your equipment. <laughs> well, when you've been when you've been doing when you've been doing this for over forty years, you acquire stuff. These kind of hackle pliers, they they uh, they spin, and it it helps. I, I, Ideally, it, that's what would work for these biots. But the rubber that's on this thing has gone poor, and they don't hold very well anymore. Yeah. I think I'm gonna have. What I think I'm gonna have to do is find a, a very small piece of heat shrink tubing to stick on there and see if I can shrink it down. I, either that or just replace them. Well, the original stuff seems to have been was uh, some kind of um, like tiny little o-rings yeah something like that i don't i've never seen any o-rings that small but uh i could probably find them yeah but if yeah. you can find those yeah sometimes you can get a kit that has o-rings in it and they go right down to little minuscule <laughs> little. yeah and that that might be the answer. princess auto yeah mm, okay the yeah, other thing he... is i've seen but this is this requires some hunting around I found a Japanese website selling fishing tackle where you can actually buy, I don't know if you can see this little yellow thing. These are the TMCO rotating pliers. They actually sell you that little piece of plastic. Like I say, I think heat shrink tubing would work. I just need, Might, need to, yeah. I, I think need to clamp them in, in, a, in a pair of forceps and put a new piece of shrink tubing on it and then that would probably work. The, can, other, the other option is with, with these guys. Tubing that choose the electrical business. Yeah. Over wires. And then I, the other option would be to get in here with a piece of sandpaper and just rough them up a little bit. But they certainly they that there'd be less likelihood of the biot breaking if you use these guys, as it has a little forgiving on the end. But the, I've tried that this week and they the, the bias just slip out of it. So I need to repair them. And now I've got lots of tools, but I don't use them all. <laughs> I enjoy seeing them every time we go into a fly tying session with Dave. I teach yeah. Them. Well, we, these were one of the great things. If you tie, like I say, if you're tying a lot of uh, chronomets and you use a lot of beads, these are worth paying money for. I've never seen one of those though well, before. Well, Where'd you get that one? So much you can't see it. Um, probably at the fishing hole in Edmonton. What there is a, is a big pair of tweezers and they've got a hole in the ends so you can grab the beads. 
Right. And the nice thing about that is you grab the bead with the with the hole casing and it makes it really easy to put the bead on the hook. Yeah, you were just moving it so quick you couldn't see it. Yeah. That's what those are for. Yeah, I haven't seen those in the store. You probably have had these for a while. Yeah. But you can look for them online just and I wouldn't be surprised if you go to the bead store that's next to Robinson's that they might sell these. Because people make, you know, bead jewelry and I'll yeah, bet you for craft. I bet you, I bet you could find them there. Yeah. First for, for Ahmed, these these are sort of specialty tools. For most of the stuff that you need to do for fly tying, you will need first off a, a good pair of scissors. All right. Uh, these these are specific fly tying scissors made by an outfit called Doctor Slick. Uh, the nice thing about them is they have very fine points, and one edge of the one blade is got a little serrations on it, and that. Some of the materials are a little slippery, and with, uh, with uh, the serrations there, it doesn't have a tendency to slide off the tip of the scissors. So they're worth spending the money on scissors. Um, the other thing you'll need is, is what's called a bobbin to hold your thread. This is the more expensive version. This is called a, a right bobbin, R-I-T-E. Uh, I think uh, Robinson sells a slightly less expensive make of those. Uh, the nice one about these ones is you can adjust the tension of the, the spool so it goes off nice and smooth. Or you can buy the really cheap ones that are like four bucks that just are uh, two pieces of wire that, that hold up. And, and they're cheap. They work fine. You can adjust the tension by squeezing them or spreading them. Um, so that's the other tool. Uh, the, the tool I didn't demonstrate is, is a whipped finisher to tie that final knot. And if you get into doing this, we'll give you a demonstration on exactly how that works. <laughs> so those, those are the key tools. Um, Hackle pliers, there's a couple of different styles like we were talking about. This style is the little English style. You probably want a pair of pliers uh, because you need to debarb your hooks before you tie. Makes it a lot easier. And these this pliers, I don't know where you get them. These ones have no serrations on them. It's a Dave, I found a pair of those pliers yeah. recently. And I found them at Michael's and they're for beads, but they have, like you say, no serrations on the bottom. Perfect. So they're like a pair of electrical pliers that you can, can't seem to find anymore. And, and the beauty of these is that it doesn't damage the hook when you pinch the barb down. If they're, if they're serrated, they, there's a chance to damage the hook. Canadian Tar used to have a ton of these small little pliers with smooth jaws. Yeah. yeah. So they might they might still do. And and Amma, the other the other key thing is the vice. Which vice? holds the vice. That's this thing that holds your hook. Now the one that I've got here. Is it is, the metal thing that's holding uh, Yeah, yeah this right. whole thing here, yeah. Called the uh, vice? Yeah, that's called a vice. And, like and V-I-C? V-I-C-E. Yeah, it looks like a vice, okay. Yeah, and, and the, the one I've got here is one of the more expensive ones on the market because I've had, I've had it for a few years and I've been doing a lot of time. You can get a good vice for around 60 bucks, 70 bucks uh, for a basic vice. If you want a rot what's called a rotary one where you can rotate the whole vice like this, those are a... a Minimum charge is about 150 to somewhere between 150 and 200 dollars. Uh, so if you decide to get in fly tying, you want to decide how much you want to spend if you really are going to do it. <laughs> now we have. Dave, well, have we could talk to Christopher. He just started. He could tell you what he's got. Yeah. The other thing is, before you go and buy stuff, if you're going to get into this, the club has some kits. Yes. Yes. Have, John told me about it. That have some basic tools and a vice that uh, will get you started. And I've got half a dozen of them here at the house, so I can loan you one of those quite easily. Okay, I've, Dave, I've also got the club's box of um, 
fly tying vices and yeah. um, tools and threads that are really old and some old materials and stuff like that yeah. in my garage. Yeah, I've got, like I say, I've got, uh, I've got a set of, uh, I think a six different sets of the club spices that we were using when we were doing uh, group tying lessons. So uh, Ahmed, and- when I first started, I was keen. So I went and bought some stuff, mistake. Don't buy any stuff for quite a while. Talk to these guys, figure out what you want to use because you have to live with the stuff for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, when you go buy, so we'll, the stuff we got in the, in the kits is, is reasonably good. Uh, it, it'll, it'll serve to start. And, and the typical uh, advice we, we gave guys when we were running the beginner's fly tying in Edmonton was don't go out and buy a, a full-blown kit of materials and, and tools because uh, generally what happens in those kits uh, is they cheap off, cheapen out on the vice. And the vice is, you need a good solid vice that works well, that holds the hooks well. And the second thing is they package them in with a bunch of cheap material. And the best way to buy material is to decide a pattern that you're gonna tie, find out what material it needs, and then go buy the material for, for that pattern. And they come in, packages like this well you see i used about <laughs> for though for that fly i used about that much so after you've tied five or six different patterns you end up building an inventory of material <laughs> and if you're like most fly tires you end up with a great big box full of stuff without having to go buy uh, a kit of material and the advantage of that is you can buy good material instead of second rate stuff. So that's my advice is buy material for the patterns as you tie them and uh, get from there. Beads, the, the most expensive part of any fly is hooks. Uh, these guys are, this is eight bucks for 20 hooks, 25 hooks. Uh, they're expensive. Beads can be expensive. Uh, they come in different sizes and colors. But again, you buy those in packages of 20 or 25. Um, the other thing that is expensive is the, is the, is the saddle hackles, um, which is this guy here. It comes as a, a chicken neck or a rooster neck. And the really good ones can be quite expensive. Uh, but there are ways... There are ways of getting those uh, hackles. Uh, what are the hackles used for? Oh, that's ma- that's this part here, this stuff here, for making uh, literally hackles for for making things that uh, allow the fly to sit on the surface of the water when it's being cast out a dry fly. Those are tend to be expensive. The wet the wet fly the saddle hackles for wet flies are not as expensive, but they're making they make things that make the fly look alive in the water. So it depends on what pattern you're gonna tie. Rolly buggers use a, a hackle, but it's not the real expensive one. It's usually like a grade three. And that's usually the fly we start teaching with, is start teaching with what's called a woolly bugger. And it's, the hackle is wound along the, the whole length of the fly. and it gives it some movement when it's being pulled through the water. Another good fly to start would be uh, maybe a Doc Spratly, basic one. Yeah, uh, Sprat- yeah uh, Spratly's okay, yeah, because we don't have to do folded hackle with the Spratly. You can just tie the, the pheasant tail over top, right? So that's her. Any other questions, comments? Any suggestions for next week? How about a black gnat? A basic black gnat. We know what we can do. We can <laughs> we we can we, <clears throat> we can do what I was one of my favorite easy to tie grailing fly. It's called a Griffith's gnat. You only need two things. You need peacock curl and a grizzly hackle. That's it. 
Dave, sometime, how's about doing a uh, Chubby Chernobyl or something like that? Oh, a phone fly. Mm -hmm. You guys can do a Chernobyl. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, we can do, I can do the Griffiths knot. That won't take long. And maybe we could, uh, if Florence still there. Is still could, there, Florence? Uh, I, sh want? I should be. I don't know what's happening. I, yeah, yeah, I should. Well, it's the way it works. Uh, yeah, something. Would you, would, you like to, would you like to do a Chernobyl land? Chernobyl lands, uh, it's definitely not on my favorite lists. <laughs> I can, um, I mean, I could do two things. I mean, one of two things or both. I could do um, potentially easier way of doing the, um, the dry fly you did today, just yeah. as, a, as an alternative, breaking a few of the uh, traditional ways of, uh, of doing this. Uh, but I found it it actually does it does work for me and it simplifies a few of the steps With the exception of the bayat handling, which is the tricky How about, how about a, an essay hopper? Essay hopper? Yeah, one of Roman's spies I'd never tie those either. I'd have to do some, oh. some learning here. I usually oh. do stimulators instead of those Yeah well. Well, it's, maybe I, that's something I could do, maybe not next week, but the week following is an essay hopper. Because I found that a very effective fly because it, it does imitate both a, uh, both, both a grasshopper or a, a stonefly. Do you have much in terms of grasshoppers if you don't go to the interior? I think they get hoppers here on the uh, Cowichan. Hmm. I did. I did. Don't you don't get a, a stone fly per se out here, do we? I don't know. I've never. I've never found out whether or not there are stone flies around here. I caught fish once on the Cowichan with a big weighted stonefly nymph in the month of February, but whether they took it for a big stonefly nymph or they took it, you know, for a small minnow, that I can't, I can't say, but I bought, I bought the flies. This was a big ugly thing with rubber legs that I, I bought at Robinson's. Hmm. And so they were yeah, they were out there and the guy was like, yeah, this is a very good fly. Well, well yeah, if it is. If you're fishing the interior, um, there are some of the rivers in the interior have the big, big stone flies, like the salmon flies. And, you know, I remember <laughs> that was my experience of fishing the Deschutes River. Many years back, I went on a, uh, a conference in Portland. And uh, one of the guys at the conference I hooked up with as a fly fisherman, and he took me out to the Warm Springs Indian Reserve on the Deschutes River for a day. And I got out there and the, the salmon fly hatch was on. And there was a stone fly as big as my little finger on every single leaf, twig, branch. They were crawling on your hats and down your shoulders and in your glasses. and. And there were these giant trout out in the middle of the river. And you'd cast, I, I, had, I had about four sofa pillows with me because the guy had given me a couple and I had a couple. And I had four hits and each one just bam, <laughs> the stonefly was gone. <laughs> Big swirl, the size of a bathtub out in the middle. I think there were some uh, salmon going through that were whacking these stoneflies. Uh, they were big fish. Hey, I, I, Dave, yeah. uh, I can verify that there are stone flies on the couch and at certain yeah. times you can see the uh, the case of this stone fly all over the rocks. Uh, I can't How remember big are when. They? How big uh, are they're, they? They're pretty darn big. Uh, well, half an inch maybe. Half an inch, yeah. Yeah, they're not the size of the, uh, the ones in... Uh, oh, yeah. 
like the golden stones that we get on the bow. Yeah, no, they're not that big, but. I wonder if they're the squalas, the, the small black ones that we get in the early, early spring. Uh, yeah, I think it's quite early spring. I've seen them there. Yeah, that's probably the squalas. And they're about half an inch. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There yeah, the ones I was asking about earlier are the really small winter stones. They're almost like the size of an ant. Yeah, that's the squalas. Yeah. Mm, no, those are the ones that you find crawling on the snow. Yeah. Um, on this the side squalas. of the Rockies, basically, as if you go to like, the national parks in Jasper, you see those guys end of April, yeah. they're still scurrying about on, uh, on the snow and ice banks on the, on, along the yeah. Athabasca, for example. Yeah. So I have a very simple, uh, I have a very simple nymph for those guys. It takes 30 seconds to tie two moose hairs and a little bit of peacock curl behind the bead. Hey, uh, I've got a question for uh, everybody. Has uh, somebody mentioned that uh, you could use that uh, stonefly you tied uh, today, Dave, in lakes? Has anybody ever seen stoneflies in BC lakes? I don't think I have. No, the, 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 uh, be, the prince nymph is not a stonefly imitation. It's a mayfly nymph imitation. Oh, really? Yeah. And I don't know why the white thing, the white thing, the white things I think are just an attractor. Oh, okay. Okay. Interestingly enough, guys, I contacted a company called Tigo Fly, and it took me three weeks to get the, uh, the merchandise, but I bought all sorts of stuff from them at about a quarter of the price of buying it at retail here. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, they bought all sorts of, uh, you know, crystal flash and uh, beads and so on, and, and really inexpensive. Is that the one in Vancouver, Tony? No, they're actually shipped out of the Orient. Yeah. They're shipping, they just send you a little box, um, and quite nice, they, gave, they give you a gift as well, with some extra stuff when you buy from them. And I think for, I spent 50 bucks, and I got a ton of, Stuff that I didn't have. You know, it would have cost me probably three or four times that buying it at, uh, I hate to say it, Robinson's. I do try and support them, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, post the name of the place on uh, the site there, Tony. Tigo Fly, T I G O F L Y. Tigo Fly. Yeah, they said I bought all these, um, you know, the boxes of beads like that. It was a couple of bucks, you know. Yeah. You know, there's still multiple, you know, this sort of thing as well. Worth a look. Yeah. When you're starting out, if you don't have a lot of money, yeah. But like I say, for me, I, I've, I've acquired most of the stuff I've got over the years, not from any one retailer. And because you buy a little, you buy, you buy one grizzly hackle that might cost 60 bucks uh, for, a, for a good saddle. And that'll last you for a decade. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't begrudge some of the prices. The, the, the local retailer's got to survive somehow. No, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, when my dear wife went out and bought me a uh, fly tying desk. I don't know see if you can see it. She had a fill uh, in. Uh, oh, where am I? Here we go. Yeah. Ah, nice. So really nice. Got all the drawers fit in under the um, under the vice that you just sweep all the tailings and bits and pieces that you don't use. So. What's your vice? Sorry. What kind of vice is it? Who's vice? Um, I was just, uh, I just clipped this on myself. So it's just a regular vice, Dave. Yeah. There are more expensive vices than mine. mine mine's a Dynaking. 
Dyna I think we've got the same one actually. The Dyna King, I, I like it because I, I, I you know, I, I have an engineering background and I like well machined pieces of equipment. Yeah. <laughs> but it's that's pricey. The uh, the Renzetti Traveler is a is a more affordable version of a rotary vice. But the peak vice is actually a pretty nice vice for the price. I don't know how grand this is even. I never even thought about that. Um, but the most expensive vice is the one that uh, Mark Petitjean sells. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful piece of Swiss manufacture, but man, is it ever expensive. I think, I think the vice with the uh, special extended clamp is like 600 bucks. Oh my goodness me. Yeah. Hey, I, if you want, if you want interesting tools, I can show you some really neat tools that I bought way back from Marc Petitjean when he was on tour. Right. Uh, Couple of really nice scissors and some hackle pliers. They're very light, lightweight stuff. They're a surgical quality <laughs> aluminum <laughs> for most part. And his uh, his magic tool, which I very seldom use because uh, I don't work a lot with CDC, but the magic tool is quite the deal too. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if, if you want to know how to how to how to use CDC to make a a uh, hackle for a sort of a fluffy fly. Uh, I can show you that one day, but it is a bit of a pain. <laughs> like, pain. like every week when you tie something, I'm missing one piece of something here. <laughs> well, I'll we'll try to get the uh, the materials posted early enough that if you need to go talk to Matt. Uh, I know. I, I mean, I could have gone yesterday and got them, but it's just too yeah. lazy. Hey, uh, Dave, can I ask you a question on the uh, chat from the guys that were up at Peter Hope? Uh, somebody was holding a, a sedge, and uh, did you see that picture of the sedge they were holding? No, I didn't. Oh, well, it, it looked to me like it was maybe a traveling sedge. It was a pretty good size, and it looked like it had a greenish underbelly on it. Yeah. But uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't say. No. Well, it, it, it's pretty damned hard to uh, identify insects out in the field, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the book with you, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> did Did you ever uh, Did you ever know uh, uh, what's his name? No, uh, the fellow in Alberta that. Uh, was the Mayfly specialist? No, uh, no. He wrote a book called Mayflies that's about the eight thick. Oh. And it's all of the Pacific Northwest May Mayfly species covered. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know him. I have a copy. <laughs> Actually, I donated this. I had a spare copy that I donated to the Hague Brown guys. Uh, right. So, Dave, have you ever used um, a um, Hamel's killer? In New Zealand, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. That'd, be, that'd be a fun one to do. I've never used one here. Uh, Evidently, um, I tied one in Ontario and I used to fish with uh, on my lake. Um, yeah. And it was deadly. Really yeah. deadly. <laughs> Both the trout and the bass. You know, this this fellow is right here. I don't know if you can see. You should probably recognize. Yeah, here's a yeah, here's a little yeah. That's bigger than what we would tie we would are tying. Yeah. Yeah, you use a, a hand hackle for those. Yes. The, so the pretty, the pretty one is the Mr. Gibson, right? Mallard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Hamels, there's a number of those style of flies where the, the feathers are tied on the side of the hook, where you have like a chenille body and you tie the feathers on the side of the hook. Yeah. Uh, this is not exactly like the New Zealand one. Uh, yeah, it looks a little different. Tied right. differently uh, by some Canadian, uh, but forget his name. Mm. 
and it's not exactly like the New Zealanders, but it's a very, very effective fly. I haven't used it in BC yet. I don't know why it wouldn't. It's just, I, I didn't tie a whole lot of them when I was in New Zealand. I haven't tied many since I got back, so. But they yeah. did they did work uh, in, in, in Rotorua and, and Taupo, they did right. work. Interestingly enough, in Florida, this was a great one, big salt water. Yeah. We catch all kinds of jacks and yeah. red and things like that. But, so that's done with the, the mallard flank tied over top of the hook? Over the top, correct. Ah, because the, the killer style are usually tied on the side. I yeah. Gamble. Yeah. So if you're looking at the top of it, yeah, uh, basically the look, and then underneath, and then you have a couple of different colors of chenille underneath, thing. Eh? Yeah. Do a red or a white. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why those wouldn't work as a bait fish imitation here. Yeah, it sure would. It's really good with, uh, especially on jacks. Mm, wow. <laughs> Dave, thanks. I got to go, but uh, yes. thanks for the enlightening. I still have my oh. Prince Nymph from the time when we did it uh, in the 